In this video, we will continue the topic we started with the previous video on density of states and charge carrier concentration. In the last lecture, we determined the charge carrier concentration for a metal, and now we're going to modify that for a semiconductor. So if you'd like, you may go back to the previous lecture, number 12, and watch that first. At the end of this video, there is a link to that lecture, or you can scroll down to the comments below where I put a link to the playlist. So this is the density of states per unit volume that we arrived at last time, D of E, over the volume of the conductor L cubed. It goes as the energy to the one half, and it describes a gas of electrons, or a Fermi gas inside of a metal. It works well, but for a semiconductor, we need to modify it a little bit, and that's what today's talk is about. For a semiconductor, this expression of the density of states is a little problematic because this energy E is continuous, and so the density of states is continuous from energy equals zero to infinity. But for a semiconductor, first of all, there's the band gap, where you don't have any density of states, and secondly, you don't have conduction electrons below the conduction band edge. And so we need to modify the expression a little bit to have the density of states start not at energy equals zero, but at energy equal to E sub C, the conduction band edge. We'll work with two assumptions. One is that there are no electron states in the band gap, the energy range between the valence and the conduction band edges, E sub V and E sub C. And the second is that there are no electron states in the valence band, all of the energies below E sub V. So that the electron states begin only at the conduction band edge and above. A simple modification to this expression for a semiconductor is to offset it at the conduction band edge. So replace E with E minus E sub C. And it's otherwise the same expression, but you see that energy is now offset to the conduction band edge, and that's where the density of states is zero. I've added the subscript C to mean the density of states in the conduction band. And again, we're dividing out the volume of the semiconductor, which we'll just take to be some cube of L by L by L dimension. So the density of states per unit volume for the electrons in a semiconductor is similar, but just with this modification from the metallic case. All that changed was the E being replaced by E minus E sub C. We can do the same thing for the valence band, replace this subscript C with a subscript V, and instead of offsetting energy with the conduction band edge, we have to offset energy from the valence band edge and have no whole states above that. That will be next. Before doing that, I would like to replace all this constant stuff out front with a single letter. We'll just call it A. The conduction band's density of states per unit volume is this expression. Now I have added on DE, a differential of energy, put it on both sides, and it makes sense because D sub C over L cubed is the density of states per unit volume. It's the number of states per unit energy, which is what density of states means, per unit volume. So D sub C of E is the number of states per unit energy, then you multiply d sub c by de to get the number of states in the range de centered about the level e. Big D by itself isn't very useful, but when you multiply by a range of energies, it becomes useful. The same for the valence band. In that case, I will replace the square root of e with square root of e valence minus e because all energies that are contained in the valence band are below the valence energy, and the density of states goes to zero at the valence energy, and it is large at lower energies. The mass that goes in front of the square root of energy is the effective electron mass, specifically the density of states electron mass. After all, we're talking about density of states, but if we're talking about the conduction band, you use the electron density of states. If we're talking about the valence band, you use the whole density of states. And so I just put an M here, but it's either M sub N or M sub P, depending on whether you are in the conduction or the valence band. These expressions fit a semiconductor much better. They account for the existence of the gap. This is kind of a funny looking graph here. The horizontal axis is the density of states function, just D, times the Fermi-Dirac distribution, F. 
and the vertical axis is energy. So from an energy of E sub V to an energy of E sub C, there should be no states. And this graph shows the product of the two. The density of states function itself starts out at zero at the band edges. And if we just look at the conduction band edge, it starts out at zero and it takes off and it gets very large. For the valence band, it starts off at zero at the valence band edge and just gets larger as you move away. When you consider the product of the Fermi function with the density of states, the shape is tempered at the extremes because the Fermi function goes to zero as you get to really high energy. So as you get to higher and higher energy, the product comes back down to zero as you get farther away from the Fermi energy. Now the same thing happens in the valence band, and we'll talk about how that is. This probability of occupation has to be modified a little bit, and we'll talk about that shortly. The width of these functions is very small. It gets larger as you increase temperature. We'll do a problem on that later, but almost all states are occupied near the conduction band edge. This graph tells you not just the number of states per unit energy per unit volume, but it's specifically the number of occupied states per unit energy per unit volume. Wherever this function has value, there is a charge carrier occupying the number of states that are indicated by that value. The next thing to do with this function now is to find the number of electrons per unit volume in a semiconductor. That can be calculated by integrating this curve that's shown here. Remember, anyway, the number of charge carriers is the integral of the number of states per unit volume times the probability that each state is occupied, which is exactly what's graphed up here. And so that's the integral that needs to be worked out. If you work that out, you have the number of filled states per unit volume in the semiconductor. So replace the F of E with the Fermi Dirac distribution. Replace the density of states D sub C of E over L cubed DE with what's up here. And you have an integral to work out. Let's talk a little bit about some of the subtleties in working out this integral. We have to do a little bit of approximation here. That approximation depends on scales in the energy structure of a semiconductor. There's a band gap, which tends to be about one or two electron volts. So in the exponential, you have this number that's usually around one electron volt because uh, band gaps are typically one or two electron volts and the Fermi energy is halfway in between. So it'll be on that same order of about an electron volt. Could be half, could be one and a half. KT at room temperature is 0 0.026 electron volts. So you have an exponential to one divided by 0 0.026. You have an X e, to the, e to the 40 is what's in this denominator. The point is you can ignore this one plus. So we will rewrite this 1 over 1 plus e to the e minus e Fermi over kt as e to the e Fermi minus e over kt. Make sure you follow that argument there just by ignoring the 1 plus. That simplifies this integral quite a bit. It's still not clear how to solve it because in the radical you have e minus e sub c and then in the exponential you have e Fermi minus e. There are several ways to go about doing this. I think an elegant approach involves multiplying by one. And in this case, one is the exponential e to the e c over kt divided by itself times kt over kt. All I did was tack on stuff that is equal to one. You can always multiply by one, but I'm going to distribute these things throughout now. Bring this kt in the numerator outside the integral and the kt in the denominator, I'm going to put right underneath the radical. And then the exponentials, I'm just going to tie into this exponential. So I have one big exponential. And you would look at what's in that exponential, and you might say, well, why do that? You have minus e sub c and plus e sub c. Because what I need to do is get e minus e sub c in the exponential all by itself, so that I can integrate this with a simple u sub. Now you look at what's in this exponential. E Fermi, that's a constant it can pull out. E to the E sub C, that's a constant. I'm going to break this exponential into two parts, one that's all constant and one that has E minus E sub C in it. Then I'm going to pull the all constant part out. So make sure you follow how this turns into that. I would also add that this 
Boltzmann approximation, as it's called, is a very common practice in semiconductors. In fact, just get used to it. It's unlikely that you will ever need to have this one plus down here. So almost always, whenever you see one divided by one plus e to the e minus e fermi over kt, you can replace it with e to the e fermi minus e over kt. And integrals become a lot easier to work with. So hopefully you see why now it was useful to divide up the exponent like this. So now I have e to the minus e minus e sub c inside the integral along with e to the minus e sub c to the one half. So I can do a straightforward u substitution and I have an integral that's more standard in form. The u sub is e minus e sub c over kt is u or just rearrange it so that you can get rid of e minus e sub c. And when you do that also, you have to get rid of de. If u is e minus e sub c over kt, then du is just de over kt. So replace de with kt du. And then manage the limits as well. When energy is equal to e sub c, u equals zero. And when energy equals infinity, u still equals infinity. So modify the limits as well e minus e sub c is now just u to the one half, e to the minus, the x, that stuff is just e to the minus u. And we've picked up a factor of kt to the three halves by re replacing de with kt du and by replacing the e minus e sub c to the one half with root kt u to the one half. That's why it's to the three halves. That integral is a standard form. It's, it's not easy to just go about solving it. That integral is in a group of integrals called gamma functions, and it's specifically this one, the gamma to the three halves. In another lecture, I might use other gamma functions, and then we'll start to talk about the whole family of them. This is a specific integral from zero to infinity of u to the one half e to the minus u du is a lookupable integral. It's the gamma of three halves function, and it just equals root pi over two. That is so convenient. You replace this whole integral with the square root of pi over two and then replace a, that constant a, with all the stuff that I had set aside to be, for it to be equal to. And when you do, you have this. It's all just a bunch of constants with temperature to the three halves, an important thing to notice, times this exponential, the thermal activation function. It's usually organized in the manner shown here. This bit that's raised to the three halves is often called the quantum concentration. Everything in front of the exponential is combined into a single constant called n sub c, or the effective density of states. And they're tabulated in the textbook on page 21 in table 1-4. And I point out right now that there's a typo, so get your book out right now and just make the correction. For silicon, the effective density of states for holes, n sub v, is 1.84 times 10 to the 19th per cubic centimeter. n sub c, is the effective density of states for electrons. That's just convenient names for all this stuff in front of the exponential. Don't read too much into those names. Quantum concentration actually has more meaning, but we're not going into that in this course. If little n is the carrier concentration of electrons, or rather the number of electrons per cubic centimeter in the semiconducting material, little p is the hole density, the number of holes per unit volume in the semiconductor. And I'm leaving that for homework for you to work out an expression very similar to this, but a little bit different. And a hint that I have is that when you do f of e, you really want to do 1 minus f of e. f of e is the probability that a state is occupied by an electron. So when we're talking about holes, we're really talking about the probability that a state is not occupied by an electron. So instead of using f of e in that integral, you want to use 1 minus f of e. And that's the only difference, besides, well, besides using the valence energy band instead of the conduction energy band, e sub v instead of e sub c. The mechanics of solving for the whole concentration are exactly the same as for the electron concentration, including the use of a gamma function. And you'll end up with this expression for little p, the number of holes per unit volume. And these two equations together, little p and little n, are the two most important equations in the textbook, equation 185 and 188. 
you're going to use them repeatedly throughout the semester, all the way through the last chapter of the book. You'll keep calling up these equations. That's why I say they're the most important equations. I suggest you write those two equations everywhere. Write them in your notebook. Write them on your hand. They're the most important expressions. You can't go through this course without having them as an immediate ready reference. You'll probably just memorize them from repeated use. So when I come back, I'm going to talk to you about the Fermi energy and demystify that a little bit. Right now, it's an abstract concept, but it has a very important meaning in terms of density of states. So that's next time, and I will see you then.